Hi everyone and welcome to today's session. My name is Jody, and I'm a product designer over at Dovetail, a research analysis and repository tool for all your research needs. Super excited today to be bringing you this session around supergluing insights, which is all about how to make your research stick with stakeholders. For today, I've brought in an expert on the subject and I'd like to welcome you to Katarina, the VP of User Experience at ADN. Over to you, Katarina. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Kat. And I'm originally from San Francisco, but I now live in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, with my husband and my poodle pup pictured here named Mousy. And I'm a researcher by training, and I, I cut my teeth in startups. Then I went the consultancy route, worked with really big companies, and then found my sweet spot at Adyen uh, when it was still a scale up. And I currently lead the UX org at Adyen, which includes product design, research, UX writing, and we work closely with UX analytics as well. All of these disciplines are hiring right now globally, so do reach out to me if you're curious. So you may not be familiar with Adyen, but chances are your money has passed through our platform at some stage. We are a payment service provider, so we work with international companies, Uber, Spotify, H&M, you name it, and we help them accept and manage payments online and in-store, providing insights and other financial products, all in one single global solution. So what triggered this talk? Well, essentially at, at Adyen, I've gotten a lot of questions around how to make research insights stick and have impact. There's lots of different people and different players doing research at Adyen. There's marketers, there's product managers, there's product designers and, and everyone in between. And so when they'd come to me and ask this question, I'd do a quick Google search, kind of looking for some quick tips. And I couldn't ever really find something that would get at the heart of making them stick. So I decided to write an article about it um, and put it out there to see if it might spark discussion for others. And you can find that article by clicking below. So the ultimate goal of doing user research at the end of the day is to drive business and product improvements, right? We want to measurably improve the user experience. So it's important that if we're putting a lot of energy into gathering insights, analyzing them accurately, all that stuff, then we should also put emphasis into making sure the insights stick, that they're applied in the products. And I sometimes find that there's not a lot of focus on that. There's not a lot of focus and energy spent on making sure that these insights stick and are really relevant to the audience. And so at Adyen, what I've seen happen is if people might spend months or weeks gathering answers to important user questions, they're doing this research, but then even months or years later, we don't see outcomes. Um, and that's a big shame. And so the challenges I've seen from not making insights stick are that products aren't necessarily significantly improved, Product teams might undervalue research because it didn't end up leading to product improvement. And then as a result, people who do research might be demoralized. And of course, in the audience today, we don't only have researchers listening to, to this session. Um, there's people who also are either involved in research or have to consume the research and then build something with it. And so my hope is that this talk will empower you to either tell the researcher that you do work with uh, what will help stick for you and really make the insights very applicable for you, or even better for you to dive in and get involved in the research yourself as well. So I've been teaching for, for half my life in some capacity, whether it's tutoring, teaching courses, facilitating workshops, et cetera. And I found that some principles from education theory, when I apply them to sharing insights, these findings have a much longer shelf life. They're more likely to be applied to products and then result in better products. So today I kind of want to let you in on, on this approach and perhaps you'll find it useful for, for your own research as well. So these are the four principles from education theory I'll focus on. And mainly because these are best practices that are tried and tested in many different contexts. And I found them useful from the classroom to the boardroom. So let's dive in. The first one is making sure that your insights are relevant. And so I think we've all been in a situation where someone might be giving you information that's not relevant to you, and therefore you're less likely to remember it. But if it's something that you're genuinely interested in, then it'll be more likely to stick. And that's why it's much easier to learn and advance in a topic or a field that you're genuinely interested in. This is because the brain finds it much easier to learn and latch on to information like this. 
there's a great quote by uh, Clayton Christensen that I like to use, where he said, uh, questions are places in your mind where answers fit. If you haven't asked the question, the answer has nowhere to go. And it really gets at the heart that um, it's important to get your stakeholders or whoever's gonna be using your research insights to ask the question. If they ask the question, about user needs or, or what they're experiencing, they're more likely to then absorb the answer and be able to do something with it because they've created that space in their mind for the answer to go. And so something for you guys to think about is kind of what are the questions that you have and make sure that you are sharing those with whoever is doing research on your team. So how do we make sure that these research insights are relevant? One way is to involve stakeholders at the start of the research process. And I don't just mean the main key stakeholders, the main decision makers, but anybody who needs to use these insights and build something with them. Um, and so one way that I do that is to involve them at the very start of the process. This is where we're scoping the research, where we are figuring out what are the questions that we're going to answer. I like to involve people from across the company. And I do this via a workshop that I call Research the Right Thing. You can read more about it on the Dovetail blog, and there's, again, a link below for you to read more. But to just summarize quickly the gist of it, I do this kickoff workshop for research um, and get kind of gather people from across the business together uh, in a room. This will be people from the onboarding team or know your customer team or the point of sale team and the marketing team, people from all across the business that are interested in this audience and work with this audience in question. And I get them together in, in a room or in different rooms and get them to plot out what are the things that we know about our users, about this audience, and then to plot that based on confidence. And these are essentially great ways to then seed questions for the second part, which are, these are the things that we need to know about this audience that we don't yet know. And these end up turning into questions. And these ones we then prioritize on a matrix based on feasibility um, of actually finding the answers and the business impact that the answer would have. And then we focus on the ones that fall here in the top right quadrant. And these end up being the main research questions that we scope into the research project. So here's a picture of a research the right thing workshop that I facilitated. I essentially got stakeholders from different parts of the company into this room and I had them brain dump on post-its. Right here on the left hand side you could see the what do we know about the audience of interest and then had them rank those in levels of confidence and then also had them plot out what do we want to know on the board here. And then they took these post-its and ranked them, as you can see my colleague doing here, on a this would be useful to not so useful to a very useful spectrum. And all the meanwhile, I was taking notes in Excel to capture everything and then share it with the stakeholders to keep us on the same page about scope throughout. And the impact of doing this was that it actually led to the first strategic research project at Adyen that brought a lot of visibility to UX research and was the foundation for us actually starting a team that's now eight people strong. So the second education principle that I apply when sharing insights is to incorporate various learning styles when I'm sharing. So back when I was learning education theory years ago, there were three primary learning styles that I learned about. By applying these learning styles to sharing research insights, I found that they're much more likely to stick. So let's walk through each of them in turn and some examples. The first learning style I wanna walk through is visual learning. And visual learning is all about processing information through the visual sense. And so to appeal to learners that learn best in this way, you could consider including these types of deliverables in your insight sharing presentation. The first one here is the classic journey map. And here's a picture of one that I created for the terminal support journey, um, specifically for franchisees that weren't working with Adyen yet. We were doing kind of prospective franchisee research. And journey maps are a great way to visualize an experience that users are having. And they're a great tool to really bring attention to pain points, for example, that different types of users might have. And you could do that by, you know, precipitous drops like this in, in the map. Another visual learning device that I like to use is 
diagrams, right? And we've all grown up with lots of diagrams and textbooks and whatnot. So this is very common in education, but it's a great way to visualize and simplify and really make coherent more complex topics. And so I found that these diagrams that I've shared here have helped people to make more sense of the information and the insights that I'm sharing. The first one at the top here is a representation of communication models and information flows between my company and other partners that we work with. And I needed to represent this visually, I felt, because it would help product managers to really think through how information would need to flow from their product and updates would need to flow to the different audiences and to take that into account when we're building new products as well. And then on the bottom one is an example of how I've showed uh, the different ways that we segment the audience for a study. I visually do this and I animate them to, to kind of give a sense for, okay, this is the different audiences that we talk to and kind of see the diversity of that. And the impact of this has been, I've heard people who weren't even in the insights sharing talk for this presentation, talk about the triangular communication model. So it seems to have helped this concept stick. Another tool that helps uh, with visual learning is to show videos. And videos are great tools for showing the emotions and humanity of our users. So they're really good for empathy. And I like to keep the videos that I share of users and user interviews really short. So 10 to 15 seconds ideally are best to capture people's attention, but still zoom in on how personal experiences can be. And studies have found that personal stories tend to work better than statistics at building empathy among um, audiences. So this is definitely a great tool that I like to use. And finally, the last visual device that I like to use is illustrations. I find illustrations are a great way to tie together themes and patterns that we're seeing and sharing in the research insights in memorable ways. And we have an awesome brand design team at Adyen and they have an illustrator that really helps bring to life some of the insights that I find. And she does this through these custom illustrations. So here, for example, um, I was trying to convey that sometimes experiences that some of our users have feel like missing puzzle pieces. And so I created this metaphor and then we created an illustration to go alongside it to really help bring these insights to life. So now moving into the next learning style is auditory learning. And this is learning by hearing sounds, music, patterns. And I found that one device for helping with auditory learning is to discuss insights in breakout rooms. Um, so when I'm sharing insights over Zoom, uh, as we've had to over the course of the pandemic, I then like to, at the end, break the audience into different breakout rooms and allow them to hear the insights from different angles by having the people in that breakout room share their main learnings and findings. And by hearing these insights from all these different angles and voices, it really helps to reinforce them for the audience. Another device I like to use is mnemonic devices and poetic patterns to make either concepts or for example, in this case, personas that we found through the user research stickier. And so in this case, there were two key personas that came out of some research that I did. And in order to make them very memorable, I worked with our UX writer to give them a name. Uh, and we chose Monitoring Milo on the left and Driving Dre on the right. And this was a, more than a year ago that we shared these insights, but I still hear the persona names Monitoring Milo and Driving Dre throughout the organization. There seems to be something simple, poetic, and um, sticky about using alliteration for persona names. And much like children throughout history learn through fables <clears throat> and stories, our brains are wired to process information easier when it's organized in a storytelling format. And when there are common threads throughout, right? We're exposed to movies and books throughout our lives that are where stories are organized in a certain story arc. And so this is a great device to use when you're sharing insights, especially if they're more complex, to put them in this storytelling format. And here, one of my amazing colleagues has actually outlined some of the key storytelling formats that are most popular. And I like to actually format my research insights story into these types of uh, formats. So I can walk you through an example of how I've done that. 
One was with the franchisee research where I used the hero story format for this one. And I, it's, it's all about, you know, somebody, the hero of the story going on a journey. And in this case, I wanted the franchisees, this potential audience that we were going to serve to be the heroes. And so I started by introing them, introing who they are, what their roles are, what their responsibilities are, what a day in the life looks like. And I did that through those different devices we talked about before, right? Videos, journey maps, all that stuff. And then as I introduced them, kind of, I added more color and color and color into kind of who these people are, what matters to them, what doesn't matter to them, now, kind of why do they do this work? And then I really wanted to show something that they're struggling with, and that was that drop that you can see in this story map here, which is they struggle with terminal support when they're working with um, some of our competitors. And so that was the precipitous drop to really show, okay, this is something that they're really struggling with. And I used a lot of different devices to share that. And then finally ending on a high note with, well, if we do this, if we offer this, or if we really focus on these types of um, solutions for them, we could really impact the quality of their lives and resolve their major pain points. And so that's an example of how I've used the hero storyline in sharing insights in a presentation. And here I just shared a little snippet of, yeah, this is how it, it looks in the process. It's a series of post-its that I line and try to create this story. And the next and last learning style that I'll share with you is tactile learning. And this is processing information by physically interacting and engaging with it. And so one way that I like to do that, and I alluded to it earlier, is to have the audience actually engage with the insights in some way. And so when I'm doing an insight sharing presentation, at the very start, I'll share with everybody in the room a Google spreadsheet, because uh, it's collaborative in real time. And I'll have everyone write their name at the very top in each column. And then below their name, I ask them to take note throughout the presentation of anything that stands out to them as interesting, surprising, something that they can apply to their product or service. Um, and so while I'm sharing, people are filling out this spreadsheet. And this writing while you know, hearing information is a, an age old tool for, for helping to aid with memory. Um, and I found even like weeks later after these insights presentations, I'd go back to this spreadsheet and I'd see that some of the participants are still revisiting it and have it open. Another way to have the stakeholders in a research project interact with the, the insights is to create an interactive research insights museum where people can physically move through space or interact with the insights in some way. And so before the pandemic, when that was more possible, I would do it this way. And this is where I had a client actually interact with a journey map. Part of it was filled out and we had her actually fill out the rest of it. And through this process of physically putting on post-its with insights onto the wall, it helped her to remember them and interact with them. And then of course, there's a device of playing and gamifying. Um, this is a great way to get the brain engaged. And so for example, creating persona cards or some sort of way to have people interact and uh, create a game out of the insights. And so all in all, when all these different learning styles are incorporated into your insights sharing, you're more likely to have the insights be memorable and applied to your product. So the third education principle I'd like to share is to present stakeholders with a challenge. And the human brain really loves to noodle on a challenge or a puzzle. It's a way to get engaged and interested in content. And so in addition to using all the devices I mentioned before, what I like to do is to position an insight as a challenge that the audience cares about. And so an example of how I've done this before is to use devices I mentioned before, you know, sharing the, the insights and the challenges our users are facing through a colorful journey map, through videos explaining the detail of their experience, and direct quotes that actually show monetary and time implications of their experiences. And then at the very end, framing it as all as a 
how might we challenge to discuss? So in this case, it was how might we demonstrate the speed of our support to, to our merchants? And then this was used as a foundation for a discussion after the insights sharing, again, in those breakout rooms, people were formed in groups where they would discuss this. And by framing it as a challenge, people really had to engage and already start to think, okay, how can I apply these insights? And I found that really helps um, for people to remember them better. And the fourth and final educational principle I'll share today is to keep it minimal. We've all had the experience of a lecture that included way too much information and we less left not really grasping anything. And so one way to, to prevent that and to make sure that essentially we're showing quality over quantity of insights is to make sure that um, the user value of the insights, sorry, I'm gonna <laughs> stop there. I think I really messed this up. So pause and then go back. So I'll start from this slide. So the fourth and final educational principle that I'll share today is to keep it minimal. We've all had the experience of a lecture that included way too much information and we were left not really grasping anything. And so one way to prevent that is to prioritize the challenges or the insights that we're sharing. And I like to do that through an impact feasibility matrix where on one axis you have user value. So in terms of how much pain does this kind of insight cause to the users? How painful is it for them? How much value does it offer to them? And on another axis, the effort by our organization to resolve this, what would it take? And when I map those, I really focus on the top two, high user value, of course, but also effort by organization. This one being the ones that, you know, we might call the low hanging fruit and the ones we should address immediately. Those are the ones I'll really focus on first uh, when I'm sharing insights presentation. And these ones, uh, when I've shared the first time as well, but also increasingly over time. And so when we have, you know, taken all these educational principles, we've prioritized the challenges, we've limited our presentation to the most relevant insights, we incorporated three learning styles, and we involve stakeholders early to submit research questions. We've gone from insights presentations that looked like these ones to ones that look like this, way more engaging, and most importantly, way more impactful. The insights ended up actually getting applied to creating better products much faster, and these products are actually aligned with users' needs. So in research projects where we apply these insights, these kind of sticky tricks, we see that the user experience is significantly improved. We see product roadmap changes, such as new features and flows, and new channels are created for our users, such as apps that they can use and manage their payments on the go. At the end of the day, the user experience is improved through you know, fewer support ticket tags for topics like finding something in our products, or a faster time for users to complete their tasks. Because at the end of the day, a lot of them come in to try and complete a task. Another benefit is that people who do research end up being more moralized. We see that the likelihood of people doing research again and getting involved in research again significantly increases and that researcher career paths and interest increase in the organization as well. And we've recently had some transfers into the research team from other teams as well. And finally, research is valued. And this creates, of course, a virtual cycle. We see that research will be cited at all levels throughout the organization. We see the research team grow from two people to eight people in a matter of one year. Uh, we also see that research requests increase quarterly by more than 20% that research insights are used for different means. So the presentations that I've created are now used to also train new team members, new joiners to Adyen. And we also see higher engagement during insight sharing. And especially over Zoom, you could kind of see that pretty easily in the Zoom chat. So hopefully by applying these sticky tips, you can have the same impact on your products um, as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katerina. That was amazing to see how you kind of brought across those different education principles and applied them in a way to really make insights that sort of resonate and drive impact, which I think at the end of the day is what we all want. Um, I have a burning question, I guess. You've kind of gone through all of that detail about how to actually go through that process. But as you mentioned in the beginning, there's often a lack of content around that. And the focus is more on sharing the insight out and not necessarily about making sure that it sticks. 
what do you think are the hurdles that are actually at this end part of this research process? So I think some of the hurdles to start are, um, you know, often as researchers or even non-researchers, right, people who do research, uh, doing research is can be very um, consuming uh, of a task. Um, it, it can take a lot of time, it can take a lot of effort, uh, analysis can be very like mentally draining. And so once this researcher has kind of gone through that whole process, found the insights, it can be really tempting to just, okay, great, found them, share it real quick, and let's move on to the next project. And not really make a lot of time at the end for, for sharing that and, and really formatting the insights sharing in a way that will make it stick. Mm. Another reason I think is maybe it's not in the toolkit um, for a lot of researchers. The skills that it takes to set up a study, recruit the right participants, um, actually run the study, execute it, do the analysis, those skills aren't exactly the same ones that it takes to create a sticky presentation. Um, they're different skill sets. And so it's almost asking researchers or people who do research to learn a whole new skill. Um, but I do think it's super important to get down because I've seen the impact of, of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. It shouldn't all be on the researcher though. So I guess on the flip side for these product teams, you know, who are consuming this research, how can they actually empower their researchers? Like what can they do to support them in helping them along in this journey? So one thing that product teams can do first off is um, to, well, even ask for research and, and, and want to do research. That's a great start. And when, you know, that does happen to get involved in the kickoff and really bring questions to the table, thoughtful questions that they need answered for their product. And it helps to think about, you know, um, for example, what would the, uh, what's the experience that we're trying to achieve here with this product? Um, and what are kind of the meaningful ways that we might be able to do that? What is missing right now? What do we not know about? What are some assumptions that we're constantly kind of repeating or that we're building this based on? Those are all good kind of seed or trigger questions to then bring proactively to a kickoff session so that we can make sure that the research that is being kicked off is comprehensive and is asking or answering the most important questions. And another way that product teams um, can, can help out is to actually get involved in the research. I mean, that's a whole other way. And so this presentation is really focused on the insights sharing part, but a good way to, to learn about the insights is also to be involved in gathering them because it's kind of gets at that tactile learning style when you're engaged with something, engaged with information, you're hearing it, you're trying to process it, you're analyzing it, you're more likely to remember it. And so also getting involved in research and asking to be involved in the interviews or usability testing sessions or whatever is happening, even in, in you know, the analysis as well, we found great success um, with doing co-analysis before. These are great ways for everyone to learn about the insights. And that's definitely something product teams can get involved with. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. I can definitely relate to that. I think, you know, getting in, getting your hands dirty, there's nothing like customer empathy, like sitting there and actually experiencing their pain with them. So I think that's something we can definitely take on board. Thank you so much for all of your wonderful insight today. It's been amazing to chat to you and hear from you, but I think that's all we have time for. So let's wrap it up. Thank you so much, Katarina. Thank you.